the first thing you're going to do. I mean, after they leave. <laughs> do what? Try my own. Now, what's the first thing you're going to say? You're going to try them on, right? Okay. What do you have to do to try them on? Take off what you got. Okay? They put out, you're not going to put them on what you're already wearing, right? They might not fit. And Paul tells us in Romans 6, consider yourself dead to your past, to your sin, and put off the old. Take off the old clothes that you've been wearing all these years. Put on the new one. Because you are a child of the king now. You're not a child of Adam anymore. But here's Jesus. And one of my favorite verses is in the Old Testament. It's in a huge book called Zephaniah. This is the way God loves you if you are in Christ. The Lord, your God, in your midst, the Mighty One will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice with you over, your, over you with singing. Can you get that picture in your mind that the God of the universe that knows everything, knows everything about you and me, What's, what is the greatest command? No, there's one greater than that. That's the second one, though. Do what? Okay, so if that's the greatest commandment, what is the greatest sin? Do not love God with all of your heart. And how many of us can say, I love you, God, with all my heart, 24-7, 365 days a year, from the time I was born to today. <coughs> Truthfully, none of us can say that. No, we can't say that. <laughs> there are times when we don't even think about God. But, but if, if, you do, if you have done that, bless you. Uh, bless you anyway. I can tell you, there have been times in my life I didn't even care where God was. Because I was so involved in what I wanted to do. But here is God knowing all this about us. And what is He doing? He's rejoicing over you with gladness. And singing over you because He loves you so much. Second passage I want to look at is in Hebrews. How he loves us. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for all his people. You see, Jesus told Martha, if you believe in him, Though you die, you will live forever. And that's what he's saying here. He tasted death. And because he tasted death for us, we will live forever with him. It was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, in bringing all of us to glory. We'll see in John 17, that God puts His glory on us. We share in the glory of God because of who Jesus did and what He did for us. And He who sanctifies, and those who are being sanctified, that's us, are all of one. We're all brothers and sisters. <laughs> There's no Jew, no Greek, no black, no white, no rich, no poor, no male, no female in the kingdom of God. I will declare your name. This is Jesus. 
He will declare your name and my name. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praises to you, to God. He's going to sing about us to God because He loves us so much. He says, Here am I, the children who God has given me. You see, we are a love gift from God the Father to God the Son. And He loves us, as it says here, to the end. And that end was going to the cross for us. As we begin this series, about four months ago we were looking in the book of Daniel. We're going to briefly look there again tonight. I'm not going to read it. We've looked at how he finished the transgression where he is telling the Jewish leadership that had rejected him. And we see this. Uh, it's mentioned in John, but it's in detail in Matthew 21 through 25. If you, When you get a chance, go read those four chapters, Matthew 21 through 25, where he says on his generation, all the woes that he prophesied would come on them. And John wrote about that, but he wrote it in a book called the Revelation. The Olivet Discourse is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it's also in the Revelation. That's John's Olivet Discourse is in the Revelation. So as he's washing the disciples' feet, he comes up to Peter. And Peter says, no, 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 no you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you can't have any part of me. He said, well, Lord, just wash me all over. He says, I can't do that. You're already clean except for your feet. Then he said, there is one here. We're not going to talk about him tonight. We'll leave it for another night. Call it the next time. And then Peter, he said, Peter, I'm going to wash your feet, but you cannot go where I'm going. And Peter said, Lord, I am willing to die for you right now. And Jesus said, before the rooster crows twice, you will not deny me twice. And he did. And I'm so glad that's in the Bible. Of the original 12 disciples, who do we think it is the, the number one? Or, who? Judas was the number one disciple? <laughs> no, we think of Peter, right? Peter was always opening his mouth and putting his foot in sideways. But he was always wanting to do what God wanted him to do. And yet on the night when Jesus needed him the most, he denied him three times. And I'm glad that's in there because as we go through life, there's going to be times when we might deny Jesus. And we can look back and say, well, now, Jesus forgave Peter. He can forgive me too. And he will. Because he's already paid for the sin. That doesn't mean you ought to go out and sin. I'm just saying it's paid for. Now, we're looking, we've looked at the finish of the transgressions. Now we're coming in the part where he's going to make an end of sins. He's going to reconcile his people to himself. And he's going to bring in righteousness. In the first coming of Jesus, I got Bible verses. His first coming, Jesus visited and redeemed his people. In Luke 1, 68, he saved his people from their sins. He brought in everlasting righteousness, as in Daniel 9, 24. By one offering, he has perfected forever those that are being sanctified. That's us. He put away sin. We no longer under sin. We're under grace. He abolished death and brought in life and immortality to life so that we could see by beholding Christ our future. What happened to Christ three days after his death is what is going to happen to us at the second coming. 
in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you're going to be changed. If you're dead, you're going to be raised from the dead and given a new body. If you're alive, you're going to be changed from mortal to immortality. And we'll be forever with Him. Thus, through His redemptive act in Christ, God saves His people. What about the second coming? Well, what happened at the first coming, which is sort of a, a picture of what's going to happen in the second coming, He's going to do this. He will appear a second time to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him. Hebrews 9.28 all and all who love His appearing will receive their crown of righteousness. So we righteousness first time, righteousness second time, appearance the first time, appearance the second time. <clears throat> Believers of past ages in Galatians will be together with ones of the present age. In other words, all the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints are going to come together in one family. There's not two people of God. There's only one. When Christ comes, God's people will put off the simple, mortal state that you look at in the mirror every day, gets older every day. Have you got any pictures of you when you were 30 years younger? I'm not talking about you that's not 30 yet. <laughs> how young and beautiful or handsome you were. And then you look in the mirror and you say, well, I thought I got away with it, but I didn't. <laughs> well, one day you're going to have all that back. <laughs> and this will happen when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, and we will see Him as He is, and we will be like Him, and He will welcome us. There, when, when you go into the presence of Jesus, you're not going to read to see a scowling face like you got when you didn't do your homework and your teacher looked at you. No, you're going to say, welcome home. Because you're his child. And he paid a lot for you. As we look in the book of Matthew briefly, because we are about to go to the Lord's Supper, as they were eating, now this Judas leaves. You know, it's interesting. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. And he washed his feet anyway. After he left, he said, He said, Now the Son of Man is glorified. Because he knew what was going to This was his last hour. And then, then he took bread. He, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them. Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And Jesus said to you, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Later on, he's going to say in John, he says, Tonight, you're going to be very sad. But then you're going to be very happy. The shepherd's going to get struck. And he's going to be raised from the dead. That's good. And the joy of the disciples on the day after the crucifixion to the day after the resurrection of like night and day. It was the worst day in their life when Jesus was crucified. They thought it was actually the best day of their life because that was the day all their sins were taken away. When Christ was on the cross, God made Him a propitiation, which means a sacrifice that takes away the wrath of God. You know, if I walk outside and kick a rock, 
Would, would I offend anybody? Probably not. I'm not hurting the cutter, right? If I walked over and hit Mark, Mark would anybody besides Mark be offended? Maybe. <laughs> what if I walked up to the President of the United States and struck him in the face? <laughs> yeah. So, how much more when we strike God in the face is that a, an offense against the Holy One? See, it's not what you do so much as what you do again as it is who you do what you do against, right? right. Yeah. I know uh, when I was a kid, I could maybe dig up on the next door neighbor's kid, but I better not hit my daddy, right? Well, when Christ was on the cross, that offense that we were indebted to God, Christ took the punishment for that. What was the cost? He poured out His eternal wrath on His only Son so that anyone who believes could walk free from the penalty and the power and one day the presence of His sin. So propitiation Then he reconciled us. It's a two-way reconciliation. He reconciled us to the Father because the sin was gone. He was paid for it. And he reconciled us to one another. So that we could live as a family. We haven't done a great job of either one of us have we ever been people. So what we need to do is keep our eyes on Jesus. And when we see Him for who He is, we will stop building our pride, our kingdoms, whatever we want to do, and build His kingdom. And it's a kingdom, first of all, it's not of this world. Now that doesn't mean that there's not some benefits down here because there are, we have one another, right? Yeah. We have brothers and sisters. But the authority comes from up there. It doesn't come from here. In other words, instead of doing like so many people do and trying to politicize everything, passing laws to do this, passing laws to do that, we look to Jesus he told us to do it. He didn't tell us to pass a law to have somebody make somebody else do something. He said, for us to do it. Uh-uh. It's okay. She needs to go. You need to go back and read it. And so the third thing he did is he brought in righteousness. Did you know that when Christ was on that cross, God saw him as he deserved to see us. If you come to Christ, he sees you as Christ deserves to be seen. Ultimately, ultra, perfect, and righteous, and pure. As if you had never, ever sinned. And if you, as if you had always Obey. That's who you are in Christ. If you're not in Christ, well, you need to be in Christ. Second Corinthians 5 says this. Be reconciled to the Father. Since Christ did this and He rose from the dead, He's victorious. What does that mean? It means, why are we waiting for a king? Who already reigns? Jesus reigns now. But most of the church doesn't believe that. They're more interested in who wins the Alabama Auburn game than they are who's sitting on the throne in heaven. Or whatever your favorite football team is, okay? I didn't go to either school. Um, 
Why are they waiting on a kingdom that you're already in? We're already in the kingdom. Jesus said, if I cast out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God is now among you. He's here. Why are we waiting to become something we already are? You're already a child of God. Why are you waiting on that? Why are you waiting for power when you've already got it? The power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Why are we waiting for an age to come that we're already in? We're in the age of grace now. Why are you waiting for a victory that has already been won? Why are you trying to win something that's already been won? It's like... I'm not going to take on all that. I'll learn it. Let's see. How about uh, another day? Okay? They're out there playing football, and after the game's over, they score a touchdown. Didn't count, did it? Why are we waiting to do when we should already be doing? We are in the new covenant, Jesus said, when he passed that cup and bread. You know what one of our problems is? How many of you remember school slaves? You know what a slate is? You know what a chalkboard is? It's a little chalkboard like that. Yeah, a little blackboard, a little chalkboard. And a lot of people think that when they get saved, that Jesus takes that slate and wipes it off. I want you to get this. He doesn't do that. He takes the slate and throws it away. In the 130th Psalm, the writer says, Yahweh, if you kept a record of wrongs, who could stand? You get that? And then in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, Love, and God is love, right? Keeps no record of wrongs. You don't keep a record of your wrongs anymore if you're in Christ. If you belong to Him, your record has been thrown away. It will never ever be resurrected to you again by God. The devil will resurrect it to you, but he will not. So I want you to remember this. God doesn't keep score. And look, if God treats us as not keeping score, how should we treat one another? Not keeping score. Okay. <clears throat> Come to this portion of the service. We're coming to the Lord's table. This is the Lord's table. It's not my table. It's not Mark's table. It's the Lord's table. And if you belong to Jesus, it is your privilege to take part in this supper. And I need at least four volunteers. No. I got one. I got two. You want me? This is not a well, the church, although we're, we're a church. It's not a church. If you want to do this, you can. Okay. You want to? Okay. I don't have a problem with it, okay? Um, so I need four people. Uh, all right, I got these two and these two. Okay, there's a. Three trays back there, y'all bring those out. Uh, you might want to, on the bread tray, uh, open it. Uh, one loaf. They're going to pass and out their bread. And then, 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 and before I was saved, I didn't take it. I'm going to take it.